Good morning. Good morning. Oh, we, we have got to be better than that. We're still recovering from last week. I, I know when I left here last week, I was tired. I'm sure y'all were too. Let me do that again. Good morning. Good morning. There you go. Good to see you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being here and being a part of this day. We want to welcome those who are joining us uh, through the different forms of media. Glad to have you with us. We pray that as you join with us that today's worship service will be a blessing to you. We pray that it be a blessing for everyone who's a part of this morning's worship experience. I hope that the Lord will speak to you in a powerful way today. I hope His Spirit will speak to your heart as, as we head into a time in in, in our own lives and even in our country in which we are going to be called upon and asked to, to show mercy and kindness to people who are going to be struggling. There's a lot of struggles that are coming our way that have already, they're headed on to shore right now. They already exist in, in Texas. We want to lift those folks up in our prayers. We want to remember them. And, and there's nothing that I know of that, that probably is any more traumatic for a family than to be out of their home and not be able to even get back to their home. So we want to Keep them in our prayers. Look for opportunities to, to minister and help them. But right now, the, the best thing we can do is to, is to continually lift them up in prayer. And, and we can always pray that the Lord will move that hurricane further offshore and it, it, that it will stop somewhere out there. We, we want to take care of our people in, in our country. So thank you for being here. Thank you for being a part of this morning's worship service. I pray that it will be a blessing for all of us uh, who gather today to hear the the voices, the voices from the pulpit, the voices from the choir, the voices of those who care about other people. Thank you again for being here. Thank you, Brother Steve. We're going to get back into our worship and song this morning. Our next hymn is hymn number 593, Here I Am, Lord. Let's all stand.
going to ask you to remain standing for our affirmation of faith. If you'll look in your bulletin, you can find this morning's affirmation of faith on page 885, excuse me, in the bulletin or on in your hymnal at page 885. This morning we'll be doing the modern affirmation. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is the one true church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now declare. We believe in God the Father Almighty, infinite in wisdom, power, and love whose mercy is over all his works, and whose will is ever directed to his children's good. We believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God and Son of Man, the gift of the Father's unfailing grace, the ground of our hope, and the promise of our deliverance from sin and death. We believe in the Holy Spirit and the divine grace in our lives, whereby See, our next hymn is hymn number 437, 437, this is my song, we'll sing all verses. At this time, if our ushers will come, we'll receive this morning's offering.
may be seated, and our next hymn is going to be hymn number 697. Hey, we got you a treat. Uh, Brother Steve's been promising us, and well, since Kathy finally sang. Uh, that was the deal. I think she had to sing first before he did. Well, Kathy did her uh, duty, and now Brother Steve's going to do his today. So if you'd like to sing a special one Sunday, uh, just get on the list, and uh, we'd love to hear you sing maybe next Sunday. Here we go, 697. Next up, we're going to have Brother Steve sing, and then he'll be bringing the message this morning.
dark and pours down rain then cry to Jesus cry to Jesus cry to Jesus and live oh and when the love spills over Then dance for Jesus, dance for Jesus, dance for Jesus, and live. With your final heartbeat, kiss the world goodbye, then go in peace and laugh on Fly to Jesus, fly to Jesus, fly to Jesus, and live. Fly to Jesus, fly to Jesus, fly to Jesus. morning we're going to be reading from two of the gospels this morning that that I, I think were were applicable for this week most of the time I, I usually preach from the the lectionary because I like what the lectionary does it kind of takes us on a on a journey through the scriptures it gives us an opportunity to sort of look behind and see what's been said and to anticipate what's coming forward but but this morning due to the events that are are ongoing in, in, in our world and in our lives, uh, in the lives of so many even here today, um, I, I, the Lord just kind of led me this way, and this is where I'm going to go. Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all of your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered rightly. Do this and you will live. But he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Then Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed him, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a certain priest came down the road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to them, Take care of him, and whatever, you mo whatever more you spend, I will come again, and I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was a neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And he said to him, He who showed mercy on him. And Jesus said to him, Go now and do likewise. Now if you'll move to Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 46. Matthew 25, verses 31 through 46. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another as the shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, 
Come, you, blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundations of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or feed you, or thirsty, or give you drink? When, when did we see you a stranger, and take you in, or naked, and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick, or in prison, and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Then he will also say to those on his left hand, Depart from me, you cursed into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these, these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. May the Lord bless the reading and hearing of his words. Richard Stearns wrote a, a wonderful book years ago called The, the Hole in Our Gospel, the H-O-L-E, Hole in Our Gospel. In it, he said this, When we are living out our faith with integrity and compassion in the world, God can use us to give others a glimpse of his love in this character. This should not be a surprise to those of, of us who really care. Caring and, and compassion for people, caring for the tangible needs of other human beings has always been essential, essential to being God's people in this world. We follow a compassionate God, he writes. Psalms 155, we are told, the Lord is gracious and compassionate. As a child growing up, I, I never knew need, real need, that is. I, I never knew what it was like to, uh, to be hungry. In our home, there was, there was always food on the table. Now, I, I'll be straight up and honest with you. There was a lot of times it was strychnine and, and vegetables. That was the only meat we could afford to put on the table. And if we didn't have strychnine, sometimes we had gizzards. I really like it. I call them chicken chewing gum, but I just think they're great. I love them. I didn't know in those days about designer clothes, and because I didn't, I'm pretty sure I didn't have any anyway. I often wondered why, why Mama got on to me all the time for crawling around on the floor on, on my knees with my blue jeans on. Finally, it came to me that she kept having to put them iron-on patches on my blue jean knees for me to be able to go to school. That's what we had to have. I didn't realize that every year they, they bought me three pair of pants, three shirts, six pairs of socks, and one pair of shoes, and those needed to last me till the next school year. I, I know now why I always got in so much trouble for not taking good enough care of my shoes. That was our life. And, and to be perfectly honest with you, it was, it was a pretty good life as far as, as I knew. For me, that is how, how everyone lived. That was everyone's life. I was a good bit older when I discovered that really wasn't everyone's life at all. Some children had it better than I did. Other children had a much more difficult time of it than I did as well. As I grew older, I, I became more aware of the world that was around me. I began to see through the, the blinders my good life had given me. I began to see firsthand the, the struggles and the trials that oftentimes others are forced to face. I learned that there were children who 
seem to have less than a, a dog's chance to reach adulthood without problems. I learned that there were those who, who struggle every day just to put some bread on the table or even have anything to eat. Oh, and, and I'll go ahead and fess up. For a long time, I, I just thought they were lazy. They were getting exactly what they deserved. You, you can do that, especially if you're not feeling real generous about yourself. But then I was given the opportunity to see more. One Sunday morning, I was preaching a sermon it was immediately after a break-in that had happened at, at our new school there in, in Herndon, Kentucky. Some kids had broken into the school, and, and as I recall, they had managed to do about $30,000 worth of damage inside the school. It was an opportunity as a minister to, to begin a sermon that railed against the culture, to go after these young and destructive people of this, this generation. We needed, they all needed a dose of what I would have got if I got in trouble. I mean, I hit all the buttons. It was a fine sermon. I said all the right things, got some amens and even some good old pats on the back. But as the last few people were leaving, one of my parishioners came by. He was a director or a principal, if you will, of the alternative school system in the community in which I lived in. Feeling rather justified, I, I asked him what he thought about the sermon. And to this very day, I can still hear his reply in my ear. He said to me, Brother Steve, kindly I might add, if you knew what I knew, you might have preached it a little bit differently. What? I asked. Well, Steve, if you could see what I see and know what I know, you might have preached that sermon a bit differently. Well, I have to admit, I, I was disappointed. So I stopped him. I said, I want you to teach me what you know. I need to know what you know. I, I want the truth. Will you teach me? He said, yes, I will. That evening, I, I went to his home, and, and there he began to tell me all, everything he had seen and heard in, in homes that he had to visit, homes where he was making arrangements for their children to be, uh, uh, shall we say, incarcerated in JDC or in the alternative schools in that county. As he told me story after story, I remember thinking, if I were those children, I'd be bitter too. I'd probably be just like they are. As fate would have it, in just a little more than a year, I was working in a job that allowed me to see the difficulties that those children have. The truth is, they, they weren't lazy people or people on the dole. They were just struggling people who were having a hard time of it. I learned that if I, I didn't show them some compassion, that there may not be anyone in their life who would. So I decided that I can. I made a decision. I would do what I could do to give them as much hope as I could, that their lives could, could be better, that there are people out there that, that their lives matter to. That they want something better for them. To this day, I remember what it was like to deliver some food at Christmas to a, to a small trailer where five generations were living. Five. I remember what the eyes of the little ones looked like as I offered them something. I, I hoped that the gifts would in some way lift their little spirits. Maybe just give them, if not, but just for a little bit, just a, a glimpse of joy and, and hope. Once, not here, but in another community, I was given the mission of delivering some Christmas to a, shall we say, a very difficult area in the town that we were living in. The place had, had earned a, a, a reputation. It, it wasn't the place to be for very long, I, I was told. Not too terribly safe there, they said to me. You, you need to get in and, and you need to get out as fast as you can. 
But I couldn't get in or get out all that fast because I had several items to bring, so it was a, I was a bit apprehensive. As I drove into the community and finally found a place, I made my way to the door and I knocked on it. The door opened and, and, and there she was. She was about that tall when the door opened. She looked at me as though she was scared to death. I was a scary presence. Is your mama here? I said to the little girl. No, she said. Well, where is, where is your mama? She said, my mama's not here, but my, my grandmama is here. Can, can I speak to her, I asked. Without a word, she turned and left me standing outside the door. I began checking out my surroundings, seeing if I, if I was still safe or not. The grandmother finally made her way to the door, and, and she stood behind the door, and, and she looked as, as frightened as the child did. I will never wear black pants, a black suit coat, and a tie in a neighborhood like that ever again. Ma'am, I said, I'm really just, just here to give the little one something for Christmas. It isn't difficult, is it, to understand how Jesus felt. How Jesus felt about seeing the needs of others. Especially others who needed someone to help them. How often do we read the words? How often will you find this passage? And he had compassion on them. How many times do we see Jesus reaching out to and, and into the lives of the forlorn, those who were locked in, in some type of struggle. How often does he show mercy even to the ones his own kind would not have, have shown mercy toward? Jesus was clear. There is no ambiguity here. As his followers, we are called upon to exemplify the same compassion he demonstrated in and to the world that we find ourselves living in. We learn in our Matthew text today that that call is so important that failing to do so has the means to determine how we will be separated from the rest during judgment or at judgment. It must be really important. Jesus never seemed to pass up an opportunity to help others, Gentiles and Jews alike. We see in the story of the Good Samaritan that, that Christ extols the one who stops to lend his aid. Jesus taught us that our faith was not simply a confession of, of who he was. It wasn't simply coming to the point you can say that, that you believe in him. Jesus taught us plainly that our faith needs to have a witness with it. It needs more than words. It needs actions and responses to and in the world around us. Our faith is not to be hidden from the world, but instead, as he has said before, a light unto the world, right? It was April 27th, 2011. You might remember that day. It was the day that all the tornadoes passed through our area. It was the day that so many lives were, were lost in Smithville and Hackleburg and Tuscaloosa and other places. Some of you may remember that that tornado passed through Belmont that day and it only, it only missed my home by just a couple hundred yards is all. I was up watching the storm that morning. I was looking out the door the moment it passed our home. I, I guess that wasn't the smartest thing I ever did. But still, I, I was there. I saw it. I watched as every tree around my home fell to the ground, blown up. All of them came down, yet not a single one of them came down on my house. I knew before daylight came that there, were, there was going to be damage. As daylight emerged, I, I could see that there was one building just across the way from me that was totally gone. There was no damage to it. There was no building left uh, there at all. 
And just across from that building was, a, was just a small trailer where a, where a woman lived by herself. And, and I just know the Lord picked that tornado up and set it over her house because she should not have been there that morning when we woke up. We were fortunate. It was only trees and just some roof damage for us. But as daylight came, so did others. It wasn't long before we could hear a saw buzzing over here and then a, another one over there. Shortly, the power trucks rolled in and, and men jumped out and they went to work until about 10.30 that morning, another storm came rolling through, one almost as, as ugly as the early morning storm. I watched as two men from the power company were caught in the middle of the storm. They found a tree or a pole. I, I think it was a pole. And they got on each side of the pole and they grabbed a hold of each other and they, st they hunkered down and, and there they sat with their arms wrapped around each other, holding on to each other until finally that storm passed by. The storm got all the other trees we had left. After the storm passed, those two men went by, right back to work, restoring power for all of us. The next morning, we could hear what seemed to be like dozens of, of saws. Heavy equipment had, was rolling in. Work was beginning to take place. I was contemplating at the time how I could begin cleaning up our place and, and fixing the damage with it. When all of a sudden, there was a knock on my door and a ring of the doorbell, and and there stood a, a little army of kids that had come to my door. I knew all of them. They were, were either former or current students. They were also children that, that I was rather certain had a, they had a relationship with the church. One of the boys opened this door and he said, Mr. Kennedy, we've, we've come to help you clean up your place if you'll let us. Girls and boys. The boys cut the trees and the girls hauled the tops away and they piled them all up to be picked up later. Angie and I, of course, jumped out there with them. I had forgotten what it's like to be young. They liked to have killed me that morning and that worked me so hard. But we were thankful for what they had done. We thanked them, but they were so busy moving on to the next project that I don't even know if they knew how much we appreciated it. I do remember thinking, though, this is exactly how God would want us to respond. This is how you give your faith meaning in the world that isn't sure whether or not this faith really matters at all. This is how faith lives. As a response to your faith, you look for ways to be compassionate and, and caring. There is no hole in our faith. Jesus can be seen in us by others. Jesus changed the world, but it wasn't just his words that changed the world. It's what he did that made this world different than it is today. It is what he did that made his words believable. You don't feed thousands of folks with a few loaves and some fish or, or raise the dead or, or give sight to the blind or, or make the lame walk again or live again yourself without power from above. Jesus' words were, were only words, but his life and his ministry validated all of his words. He made his promises and his words believable by the things that he did. You and I have only our words as well. We can talk about our faith. We can sing about our faith. But they are just words. Words unless those words are spoken while we are making a difference in the lives of others. Of the others we meet in this world who often need our help. I stood there at the door. All my, my gifts in, in my hand for that little girl. And I waited till her mama got there. She was afraid of me and, and of why I was there. I, I could see it and, and I could feel it. Ma'am, I said, I, I'm, I'm just here. I'm just here to give this little baby some, some Christmas. If I, could, if I could just leave it with you. 
The first word from that grandmother's mouth, words I should say, were these words. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Mama, I said, I'll, I'll bring them in to you if you'll let me. Yes, uh, please do. And again, she began to say, oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. She never stopped saying, thank you, Jesus, until I was preparing to leave. And I just said, I, I hope this helps you. She told me I had no way to do anything for her this year. Her mama's not in the picture anymore. Her daddy is in prison. Thank you, she said. You have no idea how much you helped. On the way home, I, I, I realized she never asked me my name. Nor did I ask her her name. But then I realized it didn't matter. As long as she was thanking Jesus for what had happened in her home that day, that was the only thing that really mattered. As all of you know, and as all of us are aware of, at the very moment we are sitting here in this church, there is devastation being wreaked all across Florida. We've already seen what it has done in Texas. We know as we sit here today, there are people who will not have homes tomorrow. We know that as we gather here, there will be folks who will be in extraordinary struggles to get back on their feet. Some of them will never get to go home again. I know the call will come, and the way to help will come through the United Methodist Church. And I have no question in my mind that our church will step up to do the help. That's never been the case. What I want you to understand is that it matters. That it's a good thing when you do those things. You do touch lives, and you do make a difference. Soon we'll have information, and I'll make sure we'll get it in as a bulletin insert so that you can be prepared to help wherever you want or wherever you can. But at this moment, what I would like to ask you to do is as we do every Sunday morning, I'd like for you to stand. Let us join hands, and Terry Stanley, if you would come to the, to the pulpit for a minute, let's have a word of prayer for the folks who are in Florida at this moment. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, the word, your word tells us he is more blessed to give than to receive. Dear Father, we, we have found ourselves on both sides of that situation. We have the need, and people have met those needs. And it feels so good to have your people, to have you come and help us when we need help. Dear Father, we also find ourselves on the side where we help others. And oh, dear Father, your spirit is so great. It's so wonderful when we feel your spirit come upon us and bless us because we have given because we have given of ourselves. Dear Father, we, we know that there are people all over the world that, that needs you, that needs help. Dear Father, we pray that you will help us to reach out and meet those needs with your hands. Your hands only can meet these needs, dear Father, through us. We thank you so much, dear Father for allowing us to be a part of giving. The part of receiving is great, but the part of giving is much better. Because, dear Father, you gave of yourself. You gave of yourself to us. And we owe you everything. Bless and be with all those, dear Father, in need. These things are in thy precious name. Amen.
we won't have a closing hymn this morning. I would just like, I'll close with a benediction and we'll dismiss. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, be with us now. Help us always to be your image, your hands, your feet in this world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.